السلام عليكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين الله نصنع محمد وآله محمد Okay, so Yesterday we discussed some of the preliminary steps to make at least our children more of a recipient towards Tawheed. They were just preparatory stages. And then it's the actual concept of Tawheed when we want to teach them, how to teach them. Now I'll just cover that for the next 25-30 minutes. But it's useful anyway because this is a very important preliminary step in order to know our wadifa and duty during occultation. So it's all linked together. Okay, so when you want to invite someone towards Islam, be they Muslim or non-Muslim, even for non-Muslims this will apply. But you, I, I've arranged these for, even for our children, when you want to teach them Tawheed, the manner in which you teach them is important here. And you start off with one or two very important premises. Although these, um, these slides, uh, um, the sister can give these slides to whoever asks for them. Don't worry, you don't have to keep on writing if you don't want to. Um, whoever wants them, please feel free to give these slides to whoever asks for them. So, every person is after perfection, or happiness, or salvation, something better. Whether you're Muslim or, or non-Muslim, this is something everyone is striving for. No one can deny this. This is a fitri principle. It's a universal principle. Even a thief, when they want to go and steal something, it's because they think it's the best thing to do. It's the better thing to do. Look, they made, they, they made a mistake in the mistah, in the specific application of what is true happiness or what is true perfection. But they're after perfection. They made an erroneous judgment that for them perfection was to go and steal. But the reason why they went to steal was because they're after perfection. This is a very important premise. If you don't accept these two or three premises we're going to start off with, please raise your hand. Because everything else, till we get and prove Tawheed, is based on these premises. So this is part of who we are. Now, it's in our genes, in our nature, we're programmed in this way. But we, we call it a fitri principle because wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever background, in the Amazon, in Tanzania, in America, everyone is after something better. Now, what that something better is may vary. That doesn't matter for now. As I said, even the thief, in stealing, he's after something better. And he does that deed. Okay. If someone was to tell you that, no, actually, I'm not after perfection. I'm not after happiness. That everyone would accept is an abnormal psychology. They would have to get treatment. No one is like that. Okay. Now, so be you a thief or even an idol worshipper or a devout monotheist. Sorry. Yes. 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 They're all striving towards perfection. Now, some of them, it may be perfection in vice, like the thief, like the idol worshipper. Some of them may be perfection in virtue, like the monotheist. Right now, whether it's in vice or virtue, I'm not dealing with that aspect. All I'm trying to prove, and I'm proving it based on self-evident observations we make, is that everyone is after perfection. This is a very important principle. No one says, I'm not after perfection. Now, they may differ or err in the specific application of what it means to be perfect. Nevertheless, whatever they do, they do because they believe it's on a par with perfection. And that's 
What's making them wake up in the morning? That's what's making them you know, do what they do every day. So no one intentionally acts against what they acknowledge to be the more perfect option. Whenever there are two things and they, they see one is more perfect than the other, even if it's not, they will go towards that because they believe that is more perfect. As I say, one may be a halal living, one may be a haram living. They see the haram living as more perfect. They'll go after it because they're after perfection. But that's perfection in vice though. But that's another issue. They're still after perfection. That's what made them choose that option. Okay, now look at these three or four premises. All of them are self-evident. By self-evident, I mean you don't have to prove it through deduction and philosophical demonstrations. These are very simple things. And when we want to prove Tawheed at the end, it's all traced back to these premises. This is how we prove Tawheed. And these premises are, you, we all know that, for example, I exist, you exist. These things around me, they exist. And when I see these things around me, the plants, animals, stones, buildings, different things, I can tell that they contain varying degrees of perfection. You can, that's very easy to tell. Now, which one is more perfect? That's another issue. But you can tell the difference between a stone and a plant and an animal. Even between animals, there are differences. They have varying degrees of perfection. That much is self-evident. Anyone can tell you that. And you can tell these things around us, they all exist. I exist, you exist. And the final premise, I am after perfection. Okay, so these four premises are very important. And it's all self-evident. Okay, this is how you should be teaching Tawheed. Look, you start with the very self-evident truths. So, given, sorry, no. Okay, so now let's start this journey because we've said, we've gone through the four premises. And now we are, we've established we're all after perfection. Now let's go towards this perfection. Okay? Who is our guide? Now here, whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, for now we want to approach and prove Tawheed from a non-biased perspective. So let's assume we're all non-Muslims, for example. Who is our guide? We've established that I exist, you exist, things around us exist, these things have varying degrees of perfection, and I am after perfection, okay, let me go. In this journey towards perfection, let me start. The guide is one's intellect, one's rationality, and we all have it. Whether in the Amazon, in Tanzania, in America, we all have aql. So we, we're all starting with the same equipment. There's no bias here. We don't need the sheikh, the guru, the rabbi, the priest. Let's eliminate all these biases for now. And let's start with the inner guru, so to speak, or the inner sheikh, or according to the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, the inner prophet, and that is the aql. So here, we're all going, starting this journey towards perfection, and our guide is our rationality. So our intellect, our rationality is a guide in this journey towards perfection guiding us what is perfect, then what is more perfect, then what is more perfect. Everyone so far, is it? Yes. So that's why we're using this intellect because we know we're after perfection. Now in finding those perfect and more perfect things, we're using the aql. Let's see where it will take us. Okay, so our aql intellect, it discerns different attributes of perfection, such as beauty, strength, 
knowledge, seeing, hearing, all these are attributes of perfection. And our art sees these attributes of beauty, strength, power, all these things in different things, okay, to different degrees. For some people, when they start the journey, they see a car, okay, and they see this car has certain attributes of perfection, such as it has beauty, for example. It has some degree of power. And they, they like it, and that's okay, because their intellect is establishing that this car has certain attributes of perfection, and we've already established I am after perfection, so the intellect shows you something which has a degree of perfection, and you like it. The problem starts when some people stay with the car. And for some reason, their aql has been brainwashed or inhibited to such a degree, they lose the power to establish if there's anything more perfect than the attributes of a car. And actually, if there is anything for such people, it's going to be a better car, a bigger car, and then a bigger car, a nicer car. But they never go beyond the car. For some people, it's like that. For most people, though, however, the car has a degree of perfection, but they find, with the help of their aql, things which possess more attributes of perfection than the car. In addition to the attributes of the car, it possesses more attributes of perfection. So, for some, whilst acknowledging the attributes of the car, they additionally identify something more perfect. For example, a house. For example, this house, it's, it, it's manifesting more beauty, for example. It manifests more comfort, for example, for the person. This attribute of comforting, of beauty, of, um, of providing, all these, they see that this house does more than the car. Some people may stop at the car. There's nothing more perfect than the car. But some people go beyond. Then they find the house. Here, what makes the house special is they see more attributes of perfection manifesting in the house. And the aql takes one towards the house. Why? Because this aql, this rationality, will never stop. It will always go towards perfection. If it stops, it's because something outside it has barred it, inhibited it not allowed it to go forward. It's blinded the aql. For example, maybe media, or being brainwashed in different ways, being drowned in the worldly life can do that to the aql. One's animalistic tendencies can brainwash, can inhibit one's aql, one's intellect, one's rationality in discerning where perfection lies, in discerning what things have more attributes of perfection. So, if the aql is not inhibited, it'll go towards something beyond. They accept the car, but they say, though, I found something more perfect also. So in addition to the car, I want this too. It's called a house. Some people, they stop at the house. It's all about the car and the house. Some people go beyond that. Now look at this slide. Here, the car, then some people go with the house. Now, some people go beyond the house. They go after a job, a profession, like a doctor, engineer, architect, graphic designer, whatever the um, profession is. For example, a doctor cures. Curing is an attribute of perfection. They're curing. They see curing as an attribute of perfection which the car or the house didn't have. And they have the aq. They're after perfection. They're after more perfection. They found something which has more perfection than a car and a house. Even though they, they still hold the car and house precious. But they say, look, there's something more perfect than 
a car and a house, and it's a job. In this job, there are attributes of perfection which I can manifest. I see, which the house doesn't have, the car doesn't have. For example, with the doctor, it's curing. With the engineer, it's designing. With the architect, it's something else, and so on and so forth. And that's why they want to go towards that profession, because they see attributes of perfection in it. Some people may go beyond the profession. They may find a holy book, for example. And in this holy book, there are attributes of perfection talked about which the job doesn't have, or the house doesn't have, or the car doesn't have. And they're attracted to the holy book, or the holy prophet. For example, they see the, a, a human being, such as a prophet, manifesting attributes of perfection, such as patience, such as forgiveness, generosity, revenge, all these are attributes of perfection. We didn't see it in the profession, or the house, or the car. We see it now in a human being called the prophet. What that which has taken you towards that human being, assuming the act hasn't become brainwashed, because many people may stop at the car or the house. Many people may stop at the profession because they've stopped at the car and house. What do I mean? They didn't want to become a doctor because of the curing attribute. They wanted to become a doctor because you get more money, you can get a bigger house and a bigger car. Those people are still, they, they stop at the house stage, even though they have a profession. Perfection for them still stops at the car and the house. But those who want to be a doctor because they see the curing attribute of perfection, they're one step ahead. They're seeing more attributes of perfection beyond the car and the house. And then you go to a prophet, the prophet has a number of, if you get to that stage, has a number of attributes of perfection which the other things don't have. But even with the prophet there are limitations. You see the aql, if it sees something limited, it will go beyond. It won't stop. By its very essence the aql will keep on going because it's predestined, our journey to more and more perfection is predestined. It wasn't a choice we made. No one made a choice that, shall I choose to want perfection or not want perfection? That's not a choice. Whoever you are, from whatever background, wherever you are, you are self-programmed to journey towards perfection. The choice comes when, if it's perfection in vice or virtue, that's a choice. But journeying towards perfection is not a choice. That's predestined. If you're a human, you're journeying whoever you are. As I said, even the thief, when he's stealing something, that's his journey. He thinks that is more perfect. That's an error in judgment. So a prophet was born, let's say, 1,400 years ago, or 2,000 years ago, or 3,000 years ago. There's a limit in time, in space. It's a physical entity at the end of the day. It has limitations of its own. The act, therefore, may go beyond the prophet and goes after something which has no limitation in time or space. Because that in itself, that they are attributes of perfection too. When you don't be limited in time and space, these are attributes of perfection. The act is going after that. They don't see it in a prophet. And then, so each person may, let, I'll come to what happens after the prophet in a minute. So each person may stop at a particular phase. And in each stop, Okay, be it the car, the house, the profession, the prophet, one undergoes three mental questions. Not mental, but subliminal. These happen anyway. That first, you acknowledge the car. Even if you never see a car, when they speak of the car, you acknowledge it has degrees of perfection. The second, you see the attributes of perfection of the car or the house or the profession. It's not, you don't hear about it or read about it, you see it, those attributes of perfection. And the third stage is, you want to be those attributes of perfection. Because one of the reasons you like a nice car is because you like to be nice too. 
You like something powerful because you want to be powerful. That's why you like it. You see something comforting because you like to be comforting. So these are three things which happen. That you acknowledge something, a car, house, profit, whatever. You see the attributes of perfection. Some of them have more attributes of per perfection than the other. But then you want to be those attributes of perfection. Because when you keep on finding more and more perfect things, the reason you travel and journey and continue in your journey in finding more and more perfect things is because you like those things. You, you've established these are attributes of perfection. And therefore, you want to incorporate those attributes of perfection. But one should always conclude that one can go further and find something even more perfect. Even more perfect than a car, house, profession, book, profit, even more perfect. Now, where does this take us? Assuming one wayfares intellectually and journeys intellectually and avoids all forms of hindrances and hurdles, being brainwashed, being animal-like, being drowned in the worldly life, one we can reach intellectually an important conclusion, and that is this, that that which is perfect in all aspects, in the absolute sense, we started with I exist, you exist, the things around me exist. That's where we started. No one denied that. So we started with existing things, me, you, plants, animals. And then we said that journeying towards perfection is predestined. Then we kept on finding more and more perfect existing things. Then we come to a conclusion. And this is a rational conclusion. Muslim or non-Muslim should come to this conclusion. That that which is perfect in all aspects and has no limitations is not a given existing being in a particular shape or form, but pure existence. That which all existing things emanate from. You see, we, we've established this exists and this exists. But these things that exist, these are all contingent beings. Where do they get their existence from? Rationally, we say pure existence. Pure existence is that from which all things depend upon. You may say, well, is this pure existence? It may be something just in your mind. It may not exist in the real world. We say, no. Does this exist or not? Do I exist or not? Do you exist or not? So if we exist in a particular shape and form, that, which, that from which we emanate has to exist. We don't exist from nothing. So look, pure existence is that which is absolute and perfect in all aspects. Okay? You see, pure existence doesn't have a beginning. I'm not sure those who were in last night's lecture, sorry if this is a bit of a repeat, but pure existence doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. It always was, since pre-eternity. Many prophets, or prophets in general, they have a beginning, at least in their materialistic life. Here, pure existence doesn't have a beginning. How can you prove that? This is how you prove it. That if pure existence has a beginning, what was there before? You either say something or you say no thing. If you say there was something before pure existence, it proves our point. So there was something before. So pure existence doesn't have a beginning because there was something before it, something existing and there's something before it which exists, and something before it. If you say there was no thing before pure existence, we come to this principle. This principle is an area of controversy. I don't want to prove it here. I just want to 
explain it. Some, some people say non-existence is impossible. We don't have non-existence. The likes of Imam Khomeini, Ayatollah Hassan Zadeh Amuli. Please, in these kind of discussions, this is aqa'id. Trace it back to, you know, true scholars. Not any Tom, Dick and Harry that you listen to on the member. The member that you listen to, make sure the member is also reference themselves to the true scholars. Either they are true scholars themselves, if you have the opportunity ever to be in the presence of one of them, or they reference the true scholars. Here, some say non-existence is impossible. If it's possible, show it. Where is their non-existence? Whatever is its existence. To say non-existence is, is a contradiction in terms. To say non-existence exists somewhere, it's a contradiction in term. And actually our children at four or five years of age, when they first begin to learn about the Creator and everything, they tell the parents, well what was there before? And then eventually the parents, because they're not very qualified, they say uh, there was nothing. And they shut the child up. But the child's not satiated. And then, that not being satiated, maybe 10, 20, 30 years later, it will manifest in a very ugly way. But the child understands it, it's in their fitra. They know there's no beginning. Because they'll always tell you, the child does it. They say, what was it before? What was it before that? What was it before Adam? What was it before this and before that and before that? The answer is, there is no beginning. Because Allah has no beginning. Look. And Allah always manifests, always creates. He never sleeps. Allah's attributes are always manifesting. There is no beginning in creation. Yes, there's a beginning in the creation of planet Earth. It has a beginning and an end. But before planet Earth, there was something else. There was something else. This Big Bang theory, we have to explain it. What do you mean by Big Bang? Do you mean there's out of nothingness? Something came into existence? If that's the case, we say no. We don't accept it. Are you saying the Big Bang came from a, single, a few particles? Is that the case? So it came from something. That's still a bit more plausible. Now, answer this. If, if it came from these particles, beyond those particles, was there anything else? If they said no, there was no thing else, that's problematic again. Because there's no area in this infinite physical cosmos, there's no area that is existence free. It's impossible. Now, so pure existence doesn't have a beginning. Pure existence doesn't have an end either. If it has an end, what was there beyond that end? The same protocol we use again, the same methodology. If you say there was something, we say, okay, so existence continues. If you say there was no thing, that's impossible. Okay, now, this was a rational conclusion with our aql, be you Muslim or non-Muslim. This is the way you have to introduce if you want to avoid your children then entering university where they learn to question everything. If you want them to be immune from falling into error, this is how you should introduce Tawheed. So, let's look at these attributes of pure existence we've established so far. So, it has no beginning, it has no end. If it has no beginning and no end, it means it's infinite. You keep on going, everywhere it's existence. There's no place which is existence free. Non-existence is impossible. If it has no beginning, has no end, it keeps on going, it's infinite. If it's infinite, it's one. You can't have two pure existences. Because it's one which is just continuing. It doesn't stop somewhere and then another one starts. And you say these are two pure existences. No, it's one existence. It's the same thing. 
Everything depends on pure existence. Nothing is existence free. Can you show me or point to anything which is existence free? It's impossible. Existence can't give rise to something which becomes independent from it. So, if from existence something is manifested, can that which is manifested become independent from that pure existence and become something existence independent, existence free? We say no. Is existence part of a bigger entity? i.e. is pure existence a smaller part of a bigger entity? Well, if it is, if it is, then we have to put pure existence aside. We have rationality. We're after that bigger entity. We're after more perfection. If you say pure existence is a smaller part of a bigger thing, it's a limitation. The rationality can't accept it. It'll keep on going after more perfection. So look, these are all attributes that the rational mind... No, we haven't used verse of the Quran traditions yet. This is a rational endeavor. So, this term, Allah, that we use, that the theologians use, is a name. It's a name. It's a label. What does this label represent? When we say Allah, what are we referring to? Okay, and the answer is pure existence. Allah doesn't have a beginning. Allah doesn't have an end. Everything emanates from Allah. Allah is infinite. Allah is one. Nothing is Allah free. Look. This is what we mean. But the way some people understand this, it's as if they've got it from, you know, a fable. It's a, like a, something totally imaginary. It's a reality, and this reality is pure existence. Nothing is Allah free. Nothing is independent from Allah. Nothing is independent from pure existence. And this is, in Surah Al-Ikhlas, this is what we're saying every day. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim qul Who? Who? Qul who? Who is the name of Allah? It's an esoteric, botany name. Who, what, what we call who, the philosophers call pure existence. Him, pure existence. It's all pure existence. Allah is a zahiri name of that who. Qul who Allah ahad is one. But this one is a one which doesn't have a two or a three or a four. Because two becomes independent from one. Three becomes independent. It's another number. Whereas this one, it's only one. And everything else is dependent on this one. I'll explain that more in a minute. Allahu Samad. Samad means all present. Not empty of anything. Samad is when something is empty less it's not there's no emptiness in it what do we mean How, can you find anything which is empty of existence no allah samad or in the quran samad is defined by the verse wal awwalu wal akhiru wal dahiru wal batin he's the first the last the outer the inner of all things for example in a clothes shop we see a pair of trousers, a pair of gloves, a hat, but the, the, the RF sees nothing but thread. This is just an analogy, okay? It's an analogy for pure existence. It's all thread there, but this thread is manifesting as trousers, as a shirt, as a hat, but it's all thread. Here, whichever way you turn, there's the face of Allah. Here, whichever way you turn, it's a manifestation of pure existence. It's pure existence manifesting as a moon, sun, animals, plants. Whichever way you turn, 
But you get drowned in the sun and the moon and the plants and you become oblivious to pure existence. He does not give birth, Lam Yaled. When a mother gives birth, the child becomes independent from the mother. With Allah, with pure existence, no. Whatever emanates from pure existence, it's still an existing thing and dependent on pure existence. Walam yulad. Nothing gives birth to pure existence. If it does, we go after that. If pure existence is a smaller picture of a bigger part, we put it aside and we go towards that bigger part. Walam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad. There's no equal to him? Yes. Can you find anything equal to pure existence? How can that be? It's infinite. It's uh, all present. It's everywhere. What? Yes. Okay. So, now for, you say to the child, yes, welcome to existence. That is what we mean, Allah. And now you've acknowledged it. Now you've seen the attributes of pure existence around you. Because when you see the curing attribute in the doctor, when you see the beauty of the car, when you see the power of something else, whatever, these are all emanating from pure existence. It means pure existence must have all these attributes if its manifestations have these attributes. A doctor cures. A doctor is something that exists. So it's dependent on pure existence. So pure existence must have the attribute of curing for its manifestation to cure. It's not possible for pure, is it pure existence not to have the curing attribute, but its, its result, its offset, its manifestation does have the curing attribute. That's not possible. For example, how can I teach you if I don't have the knowledge? And then you learn. If I, I don't have the knowledge. And this is something that even when the child is born, they, they, they establish that the mother and the mother's chest exists. Otherwise, the child wouldn't have gone towards the chest. Even there, the child is saying, Allah, Allah. Even there, the child is, is substantiated before the child that pure existence is. Otherwise, if the child won't have understood that this chest exists, it won't have gone towards it. So, this is how we have to go through Tawheed. And if you don't, it's going to cause a lot of problems. You may have heard of, you know, scientists like Dawkins, Hawkins, and these people have written different books. Dawkins has a book, The God Delusion. Yes, I've gone through it. Two chapters are worth reading. Most of it is rubbish. But two chapters, there's some kind of argument he puts forward. And Hawking, he approaches things in a different way. But what many of, a lot of what both of them say, it, they're correct. But they're attacking a particular God. It depends how you have described God to them. If you describe God in a limited way, they're right to point this, these deficiencies of that so-called God. It depends who. That, usually they're, they're attacking the Judeo-Christian God. And they're assuming that that's the same God in Islam. That once upon a time, for example, there's God and nothing. Look. Then God creates something out of no thing. That kind of God. Where God creates from non-existence. That's how the Jews describe God. That's how the Christians do it. And that's how many Muslims do it too. Many Muslims, they have the label of being a Muslim, but doctrinally they are in Tawheed, they're just like a Christian, doctrinally. And that means, as a Muslim, okay, they're not najis on the outside, because they say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, but on the inside, they're najis. There's no doubt about it, to some degree at least. 
because they believe in the Judeo-Christian God without knowing it. They may be Hindu without knowing it, depending on how they understand the Ma'ad. The way people rationally describe Ma'ad, it's no different to reincarnation. Imam Khomeini speaks of intercession, saying many people, the way they look at intercession, Shafa'ah, they're just like Christians. So, once upon a time, there's Allah and nothing. And then Allah decides to create, and He creates the sun, the moon, out of no thing. We, we call this kind of mentality or um, thinking, they call it creationists. That's what creationists believe. Now, they may be Jew, Christian, whatever, where Allah uh, creates from no thing. Now look, first of all, look at the number of deficiencies you've ascribed to Allah by, by giving this story to your child. First of all, you're saying, like the Christians and Jews, that Allah sleeps on the seventh day. Or Allah sleeps in general. Why? Because Allah is and He is not creating. He is not manifesting His attributes. If you believe Allah, for even a period of time, doesn't manifest his attributes, your aql has the right to go beyond that Allah and say, I'm after something more perfect. That's, li that's a limitation. Secondly, non-existence, we said it's impossible. But let's assume it exists. Let's assume. Thirdly, you're saying Allah created something out of no thing. That's a contradiction in terms. What do you mean? Look, you can't, you know, attribute the impossible. Look, the impossible are non-existent. The impossible can't exist. You can think about them, but they don't exist. Once, um, with Imam Rida alayhi salam, someone asked that, can you put the world in an egg? That person wasn't very, wasn't very strong in knowledge. And the Imam understood that. And the Imam said, well, look at your eyes, it's very little. It can see much larger than itself. And that person said, alhamdulillah, mashallah, mashallah, and went, he was content. But once a Jewish philosopher asked the same question to the Imam, then the Imam said, the impossible can't be attributed to Allah. That you say, can Allah put the world in an egg? How can you put something which is bigger into something which is smaller, physically? Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. It has to be shay'in. It has to be a thing real, existing. If it's a no thing, if it's a la shay, it's impossible. In Allah, Allah kulli shay in qadir. So if you can Allah make two plus two, six? No, that's a la shay. It doesn't exist. It's not possible. It's impossible. Allah's power is only in relation to the possible. That's the way he's, it's all existence. Now, this existence is not empty in any place. It's everywhere. It is pure existence. Now you want to find something, 2 plus 2 is 6. Beyond that, we don't have anything beyond it. It's all things which are, exist. So here, see, that one kind of explanation to children, you teach them that and then that's it. And then they never are taught Tawheed until they go to university and look at the side effects this can have on the child. When they go to university, now they bring some arguments against God and they don't know how to answer it. So this is very important. This route is a philosophical route. It's a rational route. And with this route, at least they can protect themselves. They have something to protect themselves with. Okay. I think I'll stop here with, for any questions and then we'll have a break and then we'll continue with the next session, inshallah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa muhammad wa alayhi wa Okay, salamu alaykum.
Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So just one question, how do we simply explain to our children how the world came to exist? And you, know, you have plenty of beaches here. You know, you've heard of sand castles, where you, you make a castle with sand. But you make it out of sand. And the world is made like that. But it's made from something, not out of nothing. Okay. Now, the next question, the next issue is in occultation. The Qayb of the 12th Imam and our duties. In, in this lecture, sometimes, or workshop, whatever, sometimes I give you general universal principles. They're important. Sometimes I may enter the mistar, the particularities, and give examples. Oh, this one, yes. yes. Sometimes I may give examples. There I may make a mistake. So don't worry with the examples I give. Maybe I'm wrong. It doesn't matter. But the principles are important for you to take. How to apply the principles, maybe you will apply it better than me. There's no need to follow the examples I give. But the principles are important for you to absorb. That's important. Okay. We've established so far that we're after perfection. Absolute perfection is Allah with all those attributes of Allah that He has, those attributes of perfection that He has. And we want to be Allah's Khalifa on earth, Allah's successor on earth. Khalifa means successor. What are we succeeding from Allah? We're succeeding Allah's attributes of perfection. The Imams are all Khalifatullah also because they maximally manifest Allah's attributes. When they were with the people in this world, not in occultation, the Imams, there was a lot of oppression, a lot of tyranny, and they did to that degree which was possible for them to maximally manifest the attributes of Allah. <clears throat> During occultation, that is our duty, to maximize the manifestation of Allah's attributes in us, ourselves, and society, the world. To make it more and more, so that the Imam can come and with a strong scaffolding, he can lead it to ultimate perfection. So our aim during the occultation of the Khalifatullah, who is the true successor of Allah on earth, manifesting Allah's attributes maximally, during his occultation, we have to maximally manifest Allah's attributes in ourselves and in society. That is our goal. Look, listen carefully. Can you do that in relation to yourself? Can you maximally manifest those attributes of Allah, such as patience, forgiveness, generosity, power, all these things, if you live a monastic life? Or if you live alone? Can you manifest those attributes of Allah? It's very difficult. Because if you aren't with people who swear at you or do negative things at you, how are you ever going to incorporate patience or forgiveness? So we can't do this alone. We have to do it whilst living in society. Although two or three days a month, <clears throat> going somewhere in total isolation may not be a bad thing sometimes. But it shouldn't be the norm, one's daily routine. Iran had a president, a president, I don't know if you've heard of him, Ahmadinejad. He was a good president. He once, in one of his speeches, he said that we have to go in space as much as we can. Why? It was a very <laughs> a funny point he mentioned. He said, why? Because we'll know of manifestations of Allah's power that we are not aware of right now. Look, 
manifestations of Allah's power that we don't know. We'll know Allah more. The point is, we want to manifest the attributes of Allah within ourselves. We can't do it if we're totally alone, because none of those, how can you be generous, how can you be forgiving, if you're always living alone. So you have to be in society. Now, the society where you live <clears throat> has to be a society that you, it, within that society, whilst in society, you manifest Allah's attributes. If your journey in manifesting and incorporating the attributes of perfection is suppressed or inhibited, the Qur'an calls you a mustad'af, the suppressed, mustad'afin, the suppressed. In the same way, we started with a, someone who leads a single life alone in a hut, in a mountain, and lives all alone. That person is suppressed from incorporating the attributes of patience, forgiveness, generosity, because he's always alone. He does a lot of ibadah, that's good. But he's still suppressed. We want to incorporate all of Allah's attributes. We can't accept some attributes and reject the others. <clears throat> such a person, such a monastic uh, lifestyle, is in fact suppressing one, to some degree at least. Suppressing one to become more patient. Suppressing one to be generous, giving. Suppressing one to forgive. This is very important and that's why in many tariqahs, in Seyr al-Suluk, in spiritual wayfaring, it's the tariqa of the mother and father. There was someone in Rome, he's passed away now. He had this tariqa. I don't know anyone today who has such a tariqa. It's a, it's a very particular tariqa. The tariqa is this. Whatever your mother says, you listen to. Except if it's a sin. In the sharia, you're not allowed to disappoint or make your parents angry. It's haram. That's it. But I mean, if you want to study medicine and your parents say study engineering and they get disappointed, no, that's... The Sharia says you can still do medicine. They shouldn't get disappointed. They should, there's no reason for them. There's no legitimate reason for them to be um, disappointed. But if you shout at them or you do bodily gestures which are disrespectful in that particular society, they have reason to be disappointed. Where there's reason to be disappointed, if the child does that before the parents, it's haram according to the Sharia. That's it. But the tariqa goes, this particular tariqa goes beyond that. And they say whatever the parents do or tell you to do, you, you do it. In absolute terms. <clears throat> as long as it's not haram, that's the only, yes. For example, when someone's not married and they listen to one's mother, whatever they tell them. But if they get married, then there's a clash. They have to give the nafara of the wife in a particular way. If the, 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 the mother can't enjoin them to do haram. Whatever is not haram, whatever they say, you do. Why is that an important tariqa? in spiritual wayfaring because you eliminate your ego and you're forced to be patient before your parents you didn't want to do it but for them I'll be patient and do it you'll be generous you'll be forgiving but, and slowly the ego becomes eliminated when the ego becomes eliminated the readiness to incorporate Allah's attributes becomes maximum. Now, that was just an example I mentioned. The point was this. Someone who lives alone, they're suppressing themselves by not having access to incorporating Allah's patience, forgiveness, and so on and so forth. They have to go in society. Now, let's look at the society now. 
this society, are they, do they have the means to incorporate Allah's attributes or not? We started with the individual. Sorry for repeating this always. I just want to make sure everyone understands. We started with the one individual. If they live alone, they're suppressing themselves from incorporating Allah's attributes. So they have to be in society. Now we're looking at society. What is the criterion there? For the single individual, the criterion was in order to incorporate Allah's attributes, you have to be part of society. Now let's look at society now. What is the criterion there whereby society makes a judgment? Um, are we suppressing ourselves in relation to incorporating Allah's attributes or not? Look, society says, any society, are we suppressing ourselves in incorporating the divine attributes or not? What's the criterion there? How can they, how, how will they know if they are or they are not? The answer in the Quran is Walaya. Who is your guardian? Under whose guardianship are you living? Are they Muslim or are they non-Muslim? Now this, we've entered a different territory now. And it's, since you've asked me to speak about occultation and the duties, I'm, I have to go through these principles with you. Where are you living? Actually with the Khojis, this is quite a good subject because your forefathers migrated what did they migrate from? Oppressive guardianship of Hindus, for example. Look, they migrated. Why did they migrate? They felt suppressed. Suppressed in what? In incorporating Allah's attributes of perfection. They didn't see it here. They went somewhere else. Now a society and the members of the society, this is the next question. Are we living under Islamic guardianship where the head of state is a qualified Islamic Muslim expert you either say yes or you say no if you say yes how fortunate you are although like the country like Saudi Arabia they're Muslim but it's not an Islamic guardianship Islamic guardianship you have to be qualified the Qur'an has to be practiced. It's a Muslim country, but the, the Muslims in Saudi Arabia are not under Islamic guardianship. And therefore they are being suppressed. Look. Iran is a good example. It's probably the best we have. That It's not 100%, but it's a state where Islamic guardianship is manifesting to 30%, 40%, 50%, it's, it's getting better, stronger and stronger. But it's led by a just mujtahid. See, the, the mujtahid is important, the expert. They have to be just. They have to have the knowledge, they have to be competent. Now, in the bureaucracy and the management of the affairs, the people under him, even under, under Amir al-Mu'min during the time of his khilafa, there were a lot of oppression, you know, oppressive acts that they had to handle. But he's a just mujtahid now. You want, are you under the guardianship? Under whose guardianship are you here? If you say, I'm under Christian guardianship, that's, that's a state of degradation. You're degrading yourself. And since you're degrading yourself, you have to compensate now. You have to compensate for this degradation. You're belittling yourself when you say, I am living under the guardianship of a Christian. You can have Christian Jews friends, you can have Hindu friends, whatever. That's another issue. Friends are friends. I'm not talking about friends. I'm talking about guardianship. Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, you who believe, la tattakhadhu 
Al-Yahuda wa Nasara Awliya Don't take Christians or Jews as your guardians You're not allowed Don't belittle yourself You're a Muslim with the potential to be Khalifatullah To succeed in the attributes of Allah How can you do that under the guardianship of a Christian? Then, the verse continues. Some of them are guardians over the others, the, in the, amongst the Christians and Jews. Then the verse says, Those who do adopt the guardianship of the Christian or the Jew, amongst you, Muslims, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, Amongst you believers, those who do adopt such a guardianship, فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ They're going to be one of them. You're going to be one of them. What does that mean? You're a Muslim by name. But you're going to be resurrected as a Christian, partially. You'll be resurrected as a Muslim too. But you'll be resurrected as a Christian too. You'll be resurrected as a Jew your, forefather, your forefathers escaped being resurrected as a Hindu. Look. You'll be resurrected as a Christian, as a Jew. And we have this in the many traditions. But if you don't do Hajj, the Wajib Hajj, when you were able to do it and you missed that, you're going to die as a Christian or Jew. Many other things we have in the Ahadith. This is what we have in the Quran. فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ You're going to be one of them. You're going to be recognized as a Christian or a Jew in the hereafter, albeit partially. So, you have to do something. You have to do something. You can't, if you just sit comfortably under the wilaya, the guardianship of a Christian, be rest assured you're going to be res resurrected as a Christian or Jew. You can't, you're not allowed to be comfortable with such a status quo of living under the guardianship of a Christian or Jew. You're not allowed. At least respect the 12th Imam in this area. So you have to do something. Because it's... It's even disrespectful for the 12th Imam. By comfortably living under the guardianship of a Christian, it's disrespectful to the 12th Imam. What hope, is occulti what, what hope is there with you when the 12th Imam comes, when you are so comfortable? You're, you're not going to come out of that comfort zone. It's not as easy as that. If you, were, if you would be a true follower of the 12th Imam, be rest assured you would be exiting the guardianship of a Christian Welaya right now. You want to prove it, you to evaluate yourself, you can evaluate yourself. Now, the point is don't panic. The point is don't be comfortable. Okay, don't become so. What do we do? What do we do? Now, before that, there's one verse in the Holy Quran where I no, I, I haven't written the verse, but in this verse, you know, the questioning of the angels in the grave, <coughs> like man labok, man nabiyok, marketabok, who is your Lord? Who's your prophet? What's your book? And so on and so forth. These exist in the traditions. We have these in the traditions. In the Quran, in the Quran, we have another set of questions. Those were in the Ahadith. This question of the angels, it's in the Quran. So this is much more important. It's much more relevant. This is the Quran now. Where when people go to hell, in Barzakh, when they're given that place in hell, the angels come to them and say, Fi ma kuntum. What's happened to you? Why are you in such a state in hell? To Muslims like me and you. Qalu kunna mustad'afina fil ard. The inmates of hell would say, We were the mustad'afin on earth. Look, mustad'af 
is the suppressed. Suppressed in what? In incorporating the attributes of perfection. They say we were suppressed because they were under the guardianship of a Jew, a Christian, a tyrant, an oppressor. And since they were under such a wilaya, they were not able to incorporate the attributes of perfection, the attributes of Allah. They say sorry to the angels. They say, we're sorry, but we were of the oppressed, as if they're requesting pity from the angels. Qalu, but the angels then reply, Alam takun ardullah wasa'atan. Wasn't the earth, Allah's earth, spacious? Fatuhajiru fiha, for you then to migrate in that land. Fa'ulaika ma'awahum jahannam. Wasn't Allah's earth spacious for you to migrate within that land rather than just sitting comfortably under the wilaya of non-Islam and therefore suppressing yourselves intentionally? But you could have migrated and the place for such people is hell. That's explicit in the Quran. We shouldn't be comfortable, therefore. Now, if you're not going to be comfortable, what should you do? You have to compensate for this. What has to be done? Well, the first question is, is there a country, a state, where Islamic guardianship exists? If the answer is yes, you have to go. Go there. Now, Okay, let's go bit by bit. The next issue is, is that country which you say Islamic guardianship is real and genuine, is it opening with open arms for us to go there? But that's another issue. That's another issue. You know, in Iran, it's a very big country. One province is Khorasan. You may have heard of Khorasan. Mashhad is in Khorasan. It's one province. It's bigger than England. The same size as England. England has 60 million people. Khorasan has only maybe 3, 4 million people. Maybe a bit more, a bit less. But in England, you feel like everywhere is spacious, other than London. But in Khorasan, it's always busy. They're not managing them very well. It's a third world country at the end of the day. But Iran has a lot of free space. A lot of deserts not being used. A lot of land not being used. This is Iran's responsibility. I mean, they've had so much sanctions and war, they still haven't, they've never had time to breathe in these 40 years. But one day, it has to happen, where Iran becomes a much freer Iran, much stronger Iran, and they will give citizenship to anyone who wants to come and be part of the system. They give them Iranian passports, Iranian land. It has to be like that. Otherwise, Iran will be doomed to failure if they don't do this in the future. But right now, they're always busy with sanctions, all these uh, different things that are imposed, and it's a struggle. So the first question is, is it possible for me to go to that state and live there? If the answer is yes, go. If the answer is no, then the next line of thinking is, where can I go and live? Where I can do least damage in this quest of incorporating Allah's attributes? Maybe you'll find somewhere which has lesser damage. It may be Tanzania, it may be England, wherever, it doesn't matter. But one thing has to be clarified here. You imagine a country like England, okay? And imagine all the rules of England, all the laws are Islamic. 
but the head of state is non-Muslim. Compare such a country with a Muslim country where the head of state is a just much dead, but imagine the rules are only 20% Islamic. You shouldn't think that the first option is better because the head of state is a non-Muslim and they don't have the best interests of Islam and Muslims at heart. Look what they're doing in Yemen, in Kashmir, Palestine, Lebanon, all these different places. They may bring these rules, which even may be Islamic, but you're still under non-Islamic guardianship. The person, the head of state is important because they have to have the best interest of the Muslims at heart. When the Prime Minister of New Zealand goes and hugs those parents who they lost their children, we don't accept such crocodile tears. It has of no, no value to us. If the New Zealand Prime Minister wants to do something, they can do much better things to support Islam and Muslims on an international or domestic level. But these kind of tears we don't want. It doesn't prove anything. You shouldn't be fooled by a simple cry. Non-Muslims don't have the best interests of Muslims at heart. If, if the time comes, they'll crucify them and ethnically cleanse them. They killed nine million Iranians during the First World War. This has been documented even in their own books, even in parliamentary notes taken. In all those villages in Iran, they cut the food supplies, even animal supplies. Nine million Iranians died. The British did it. If they can do that again, they'll do it again. Hodges are only 200,000 in the world. Be careful who you're relying upon. You rely upon non-Islamic Welaya, you're going to be doomed to fail. It's very easy. They can do it very easy. The first trap is finding an affinity with non-Islamic Welaya. From then, it's going to be downhill. The head of state is important. Okay, you can't go to such a country. So now you have to say, where can I live? Where, where the state, the head of state, there's more trust. Or I am less suppressed. I'll go there and live. If it means migrating continuously, well, you, you do it for your jobs. Why don't you do it for Allah's sake? You're not allowed to suppress yourself. If you are, it's okay if you do it, but you've created your own hell. Now, you found some place which is less suppressive in relation to you. You found such a place. But still, you're still under non-Islamic wilaya. You shouldn't be comfortable with it. What should you do now, the next step? You have to compensate. Because you've you're, moment to moment, you're contaminating yourself by living there. And if you're comfortable with that, the contamination just increases and increases. So you have to do something to compensate. How are you contaminating yourself? For example, you're paying taxes. You're contributing to the spilling of Muslim blood, for example, in Yemen and other places. If you give a thousand dollars or shillings, whatever, make sure you give a thousand or even double that for an Islamic cause. To those in Yemen, in Palestine, do something. Compensate for that money. Assuming it was, there was no other choice. You had to stay there. There was no other choice. Don't be comfortable with it. You give taxes, you compensate for it. Education. What are you going to do with the education of your children when they teach you homosexuality is a fit three thing from a young age when they teach you these kind of things and you take your children and put them in such a setting, maybe not here in Tanzania but in England and other places. You have to 
compensate. Now, how you compensate, maybe you have better ideas than me. But you have to compensate. If you don't compensate, you're going to be one of them. Partially, at least partially. You have to choose a place to live and choose a profession to live that was the imam to come tomorrow, you would continue living in that place or continue with your profession. Continue with what you're doing. Not that when the imam comes down you have to change everything. That means you weren't doing the right thing. Being a doctor is a good profession, for example. Being an architect, engineer, nurse, a veterinary doctor, whatever. Any profession has degrees of perfection associated with it. But sometimes the profession is to get a bigger and bigger house, a bigger and bigger dunya. Look, there's a problem there. No one is against having a good house, a good car, those kind of things. But when the goal becomes the dunya, prestige, the worldly life, be rest assured you won't be on the side of the imam. Because when the imam comes, you're not going to be, in theory, after the worldly life. You'll be following a life of Islam. That's what you would think in theory. But if you're drowned in the dunya now, when the imam comes, you're still going to be drowned in the dunya. There's not going to be a drastic change. If you're a thief, you're still going to be a thief. If you're a hypocrite, you're still going to be a hypocrite. You're not going to change by a simple coming and using a physical entity. All those people, the munafiqeen, they saw the holy prophet, they saw Amir al-Mu'mini, but they were hypocrites. If we're hypocrites, we're going to remain as hypocrites. So, we have to choose a job and a place where we are least suppressing our journeying in incorporating Allah's attributes. Now, you want to be a doctor? Well, that doctor involves many attributes of perfection, as we discussed, including curing. It's an attribute of Allah, it's good. But is that it? You're not going to just focusing on that and then just earning more and more? If, if, if it's a question of earning why you want to be a doctor, there's no different to you and someone who stops at the car or house stage, if you remember that diagram. But you want to be a doctor, yes, and then you want to look for more perfection. You have to be after more perfection, incorporate more perfection. That place, that profession, that lifestyle, and your guess can be as good as mine. I don't want to enter the particularities. That place, that profession, that lifestyle, which suppresses you least, that's where you have to go. If you can't go to an Islamic state where there's true Islamic leadership, you have to go there. And you have to monitor what the government there is doing. You have to be aware. Don't feed the oppressive economies of the day. Imagine all the Muslims of England, France, Germany were to leave tomorrow. Those tyrannical, oppressive governments, they'll crumble. They're, they're being fed, they're thriving on the Muslim resources in Germany, in France. We're not allowed to comfortably feed such a system. So you have to be aware of what's happening with your head of state. And you compensate. Compensate has many forms. One is if you give them this much tax, give double in another way. If there are movements in that country against oppressive matters, you get yourself involved in those movements. It doesn't matter. But you can't just sit there doing nothing. So, during the time of occultation, to just 
give a, to conclude and summarize. What is our duty? Our duty is to maximally avoid suppressing ourselves and qualifying as the mustad'afin fil art. If you succeed in that, you'll be working on a part of the Imam's satisfaction. But if you don't, you'll become more and more distant from the Imam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.